Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2014. Now, can everybody hear us at the back? Yeah? Okay. If, if you have any problems, just raise your hand and uh, tell us to speak louder or turn up the sound. But it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our first speaker of today, uh, Debbie Kennett, who is an honorary research associate in the Department of Genetics, Evolution and Environment at University College London. She's a member of the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, the Guild of One Name Studies, the Society of Genealogists, and the Association of Professional Genealogists, as well as the Society of Authors. Because Debbie has uh, written two books, one is called The Surname Handbook, the other one is called DNA and Social Networking, and she has them available here today to sell. So if anybody's interested in buying those books, then please come up and see Debbie afterwards. Uh, we also have Emily Olesino at the back, and she is selling uh, her book on uh, genetic genealogy as well. So do have a look at that and check it out. Uh, these are uh, excellent. Uh, these are excellent authors, and the books are absolutely fantastic. They'll they'll give you a real insight into surnames and genealogical research from a genetic point of view. So DNA uh, for beginners is the title of Debbie's talk today, and she's going to tell us about the three main types of DNA to uh, test. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to welcome Debbie Kennett. Okay, thank you, Morris. Can everyone hear me at the back? Yes, okay. Um, right, so I'm going to be looking this morning at the three main types of DNA tests that you can take for your family history research to help you with your genealogy research. And we've got the first type of test is the Y chromosome DNA test. And this is the test that follows, normally follows the surname line. And it can be used for recent ancestry, but it also takes you deep back, back in time, and it can also trace your very, very deep ancestry. The second test is the mitochondrial DNA test, which follows the um, direct mother line. So that's your mother, her mother, and her mother, and so on, back in time. And that, again, can be used for recent ancestry, but it also takes you way back in time, um, about 200,000 years, and tells you about your deep ancestry. And the third test is the autosomal DNA test, a family finder test. And this covers all your family lines, but it's most effective within about the last five or six generations. And I'll explain about all the different tests in detail a bit later. Um, the first point I want to make about um, DNA testing is don't think of it as anything um, unusual. It's just another type of record that you use in your genealogy research. Um, most of the records that we use, we have to go to archives and um, we have to get the, the paper records to use. DNA, it, it, it's a different way of extracting the record because we have to actually take the sample. And we have to take the sample from living people. It's not painful, it's just a little cheek swab, there's no blood or anything like that involved. And it just, as with any record, it gives us different answers, but we use all the records in combination together. We don't use DNA testing on its own. Um, there are a number of uses for DNA testing. It's most effective if you've got a particular question that you want to answer um, about, say, a relationship. If two people with the same surname are related, if you want to try and establish whether two people share the same, um, say, great-grandfather, depending on the question you want to ask, there's usually a, a test that will solve the, the, the problem for you. You can just use it to verify your family trees, um, it can be very useful if you've got any brick walls in your research, um, if you've got, say, an illegitimate line or if you're um, adopted or if you've got someone who is adopted in your line. Sometimes DNA testing can provide answers that you cannot get from the paper trail alone. And the, the Y chromosome DNA test is very useful if you're interested in researching surnames. You can look at the um, evolution of surnames, the origin of surnames, and try and work out how many people with a particular surname are related. Sometimes, if you're lucky, if you take a test, it can actually help your research. The, the people you match might have more information than you, um, and it might provide a geographical focus for your research. So if you're, um, you've got a line and you only know it's from Ireland, if someone else has matched you and they, they've done more research, they may be able to pinpoint it to a particular county. So that's more, probably more relevant for Americans, but if you say you've got a line in, that goes to London and um, you were stuck in London, you, you may be able to actually get that line back to um, a particular county um, in, say, Scotland, Ireland or, um, or Wales or England. 
and it can just be fun just to take a test just to see what to see what you find you can um, you go into a large matching database and you end up with matches with your genetic cousins and that it can just be interesting just to go on what we call a fishing expedition just to see what to see what turns up one of the tests will give you um, ethnicity percentages I'll explain more about that later and the, the Y chromosome test and the mitochondrial DNA test will give you insight into your deep ancestry. Um, one important point, the test does not replace your traditional documentary research. And unlike the paper records, it doesn't give you the names of your ancestors. And it doesn't identify, in most, apart from one test, it doesn't actually identify very, the, the, the precise relationships. You normally get a range within, of time within which the common ancestor might have lived or a predicted relationship range. And for the same reason, you don't actually get precise dates um, for any of the, the matches that you get. And just one word of warning before we go any further. Um, I always um, put, like to point this out. If you are afraid of skeletons, stay out of closets. This applies just as much to doing family history research as it does to DNA testing. Sometimes when people do start digging, they do find information they had not expected to find. And there are people who take a DNA test and they do sometimes find out that they are not quite who they thought they were. So be prepared. It does happen. We do have people who have tested and they found that they, they are not their father's son. So if that's something you don't want to find out about, um, don't test. <laughs> and the other point that always comes up is whether or not you can um, uh, exhume bodies and test your ancestors. Um, I'm afraid that is something that's normally very, very difficult to do. It can sometimes be done at great expense, but you normally have to get permission from church authorities to do that. So if you want testing done, it's very important to get the testing done on the people while they are still alive. And one of the nice things about the Family Tree DNA company is that you, once you've done your test, the samples are stored for 25 years, you can actually nominate a beneficiary and um, then you can have a family member who then carries on and uh, looks after the sample um, and so it gets passed on from one generation to the next. And there are act the testing have, has been going now for about 14 years. There are a large number of people in the database who have now passed away, um, but there are relatives who are still managing those kits and going on to do the <coughs> further test as the science evolves. So the first test we're going to look at in more detail is the Y chromosome DNA test. And this is the test which follows the paternal line, the surname line. Um, the main difference between males and females, um, if you're a female, you have two X chromosomes. If you're a, a male, you have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. And the feature about the Y chromosome is it's passed on from a father to, a, to his son. So it, only males can take this test. And if you're a female, it's a question of finding the right male relative with the surname to, to take the test on your behalf. The Y chromosome tests are normally um, collated within surname projects. There are now over 8,000 surname projects at Family Tree DNA um, and a huge number of variant spellings. So virtually all, well, all the common names are included in the database. Um, if you've got a very unusual name, it may not necessarily be included. But what you get out of the test really depends on the, the size of the project and who else is in the database. And the more people with your surname in the, the database, the more likely you are to get something out of it. The test works um, because the, when, the y chromosome, when the Y chromosome is passed on from a father to his son, um, it's normally passed on unchanged, but just every now and then you get little errors occurring. It's like um, photocopying a piece of paper um, and that you get tiny little blemishes. Um, and these errors, we call them mutations. And the, the test is looking at the particular parts of the Y chromosome where these mutations are most likely to occur. The technical name is, uh, they're called short tandem repeats, but you don't need to know all the technicalities. It's really, for each marker that is tested, you get a number. And then it's really just like a number matching game. Your numbers all go into this big database and your numbers are matched with all the other men who've taken the test. And what you're hoping is that if um, you're lucky and that your numbers match other people with the same surname as you. When you get your result, um, it's, it is just a string of numbers like this, and it doesn't actually mean very much having a, knowing that you've got lots of markers and these are your values for each uh, marker. Um, so the whole value of the test is actually in the comparison process. 
And essentially, the more of these numbers that match up, the more markers that you match on, the closer the relationship. And if you have too many mismatching markers, then you, you know that you do not share a common ancestor in what we call a genealogical time frame. So this is what a set of DNA results looks like. And these are actually some sample results from my own cruise project. And if you look at the first two columns there, um, you can see every single number is identical. Um, so we know that those two men, they, they share the same surname, they share a recent common ancestor. The next two lines, you can see the results, that they're all pretty much the same, but we've got two numbers here that are slightly different. But that's still within the accepted range. So those four men all match each other. And what we've actually got here is that we've identified two different branches. And it turned out that these two men with the number 27, they were all in Canada. And the, the two men with the number 28, they'd all stayed behind in England, in Devon. So sometimes, if you're lucky, you can actually have markers that identify particular branches within a family tree. And this is another one with the same surname. In this, in this case, you can see every, virtually every single number is different. So although he's from the same part of Devon as the other men, we know that they do not share a common ancestor. Um, there are various testing levels. When the tests first came, were first introduced back in the year 2000, you could only test 12 markers. Um, we now go up to 37 markers. That's the standard entry level test now. And that's um, on sale at the show at a special price of 102 euros. Um, it would normally cost you, um, it would be, be about 133 euros normally. You can order extra markers. You can always upgrade at a, a later date. Um, if you are looking for, if you're trying to find a match for an illegitimate line, I would always recommend testing at least 67 markers because it's much more complicated interpreting matches with different surnames when you don't have the surname as a clue and you don't have the genealogical records. And sometimes it is necessary to go up to 111 markers. There are, it, it is a problem with some Irish surnames in particular where there seems to be a very prolific genetic signature um, and um, it's one of these signatures that's, um, where they thought originally it was related to Nile of the Nine Hostages, and some of these people have extraordinarily large numbers of matches, and you, if you are one of these, if you do have to happen to have a match with what they call the Nile signature, um, sometimes it is necessary to order lots of extra markers. Um, the uh, family tree DNA give you a list of matches. These are the thresholds that they use. Um, you get, um, you, you see your matches at the various different testing levels. And as you can see, the more markers you get, the more relaxed the criteria become. And the number of matches that people get, um, it can vary considerably. Um, some people can take a test and they have a very rare DNA type and they don't have any matches at all in the database. And other people can take a test and they, they can have huge numbers of matches. And it's one of these things you just don't know until you've tested um, whereabouts you're going to fall on the spectrum. Most people are, um, will have a few matches at least at 12 markers. Um, it's, it's, but it's really only the matches at 37 markers and higher that are significant with a, when you're looking for surname matches. I should say, by the way, that I have um, these, the PDFs of my presentation will be available on the Genetic Genealogy Island website, and I've got all the, the links on there will be clickable links, so don't, you don't have to worry too much about taking notes. Um, now, the, when you interpret the matches, it's done um, on probabilities. Um, you can look at the number of mismatching markers, but you also get a tool that you can use called the TIP tool, and um, this will allow you to generate these little reports. And I've just put up two sample reports here showing um, the probability that two people share a common ancestor within a given number of generations. So it's then a question of going back to the paper records and interpreting these results in the light of the paper records. When you get your test results, you get a page on the Family Tree DNA website to, uh, where you can actually look at your results and you can see all your matches. This is actually my dad's um, page on the on the website, and you can see that he's got his he's done the Y DNA test, the mitochondrial DNA test, and you can just click on your matches and all the other um, uh, buttons there, and you can see all the the results. These are my dad's matches. His surname is Cruz, C-R-U-W-Y-S, and um, 
I run the, the Cruz project and we've now tested quite a few men with the surname Cruz and he now matches three other people with the surname and um, also a couple of people with a different surname. It is actually quite common to have matches with different surnames because obviously not that surnames do not always correlate with the Y chromosome. There's always been illegitimacies. And some of the matches with other surnames will actually predate the formation of surnames. And if you're lucky, the, the people you match will have also provided the information about their most distant ancestor, as we've got on there. This is what a DNA project website looks like. This is my cruise project. And um, when we um, organise the results, we place them in what we call genetic families. So I've got a, um, quite a large number of groups now, and each group, um, the people in that group, they match each other genetically, um, and it's regardless of the, the surname. And if you look at my first group there, you can see I've actually got a variety of different spellings. Um, we've got um, some people have got C-R-U-S-E, C-R-U-I-S-E, C-R-E-W-S, and we also have an interloper here with a surname Rainey. Um, and it is actually quite common that, that this sort of thing happens in this case. Uh, we call it a, a non-paternity event, a very strange word, or sometimes uh, Emily coined the word, not the parent expected. Um, and in this particular case, we went up to 67 markers, and it was two men in America, and there was a Mr. Rainey and there was a Mr. Cruz, and they were both living in the same um, county in, in America. Um, so we think there had been some sort of uh, event in the past that hadn't been revealed to the, to the family. Um, and the Mr. Rainey was actually quite happy because he'd been in the, his Rainey project and, hadn't, and there were lots and lots of Rainies tested and he hadn't had any matches at all. And then suddenly my Mr. Cruz came along and tested and he had a match after waiting all that time. Um, now this is just an example of how you can use the testing and the sort of answers it, that it can reveal sometimes in the absence of any paper trail. I had um, a researcher come to me um, back in, I think it was about 2006, and the story that he told me was that his ancestor had been, uh, were, had been shipwrecked off the coast of South Africa, and apparently he'd swum to shore, and he was the sole survivor of this shipwreck. And there is a place in, uh, just off Hawkston in South Africa that's actually called Harry's Bay in honour of um, this ancestor, Harry Cruz. When he started to research his family tree, um, the South African records were pretty, pretty poor. Um, the only um, clue that he had was from a death notice. And on this death notice, it gave um, Henry's name. He, he died at a young age. He was only 36 years old. And the only clue about his origins uh, was that he was born somewhere in Great Britain. So that gave us a choice of three different countries numerous different counties, and we were trying to look for a Henry Cruz born around about 1826 somewhere in Great Britain. That predates all the civil registration records. He employed a researcher at great expense trying to um, track down his ancestry, trying to look at all the Henry Cruises, the baptisms for Henry Cruises that um, he could find, and he was getting absolutely nowhere. So he was one of the first people who joined my DNA project. And he sat in the project for about a year, um, he didn't get any matches, and he, he didn't match anyone else in the database at all. And then I started to get some other cruises tested, and then finally we got some matches. And it turned out that he matched four other men with the surname C Cruz, C-R-U-S-E, and in, in all these cases we'd got very, very detailed family trees, and we'd, we'd managed to trace the tree right back to um, a, a small village called Ogbourne St George in Wiltshire, um, so from these close, very close matches, we knew that this Harry Cruz was somehow related to this Wiltshire tree. And we're still trying to actually find the connection. Um, it's a question of going again back to the paper trail. We think it went somewhere through London. But now we know precisely where to look rather than having the whole of Great Britain to search for the answers. The other part of the, the Y chromosome test is the, the deep ancestry aspect. And with your, the test result, you are told your haplogroup. And your haplogroup is your branch on the human Y DNA tree. Um, and each of the, the branches, they all have their own geographical origins. Um, so you will find haplogroup A, haplogroup B are mostly found in Africa. Um, haplogroup C is, um, is the one that's found in Aboriginals in Australia. There's a particular branch of haplogroup Q that's only found in Native Americans. 
and the, the haplogroups, um, we can actually put them all together in a massive tree. Um, and if you want this, you, you, when you know which haplogroup you are, most Irishmen will be this R1B haplogroup. But the tree actually, tra you can trace your tree all the way back up here, all the way back up here. And we get to this point right at the top, which is the most recent common ancestor of all males on the planet. Every single person who's taken a Y-DNA test will fit somewhere on this tree. And everyone goes back to that recent common ancestor who we call Y-chromosomal Adam. And he is thought to have lived something like 338,000 years ago. So with DNA, you can actually trace your tree back 338,000 years. Um, in Ireland, these are the main haplogroups that you'll find. R1B is the predominant one, um, and, but you will also see some of these other um, haplogroups as well. Um, if you are interested in the deep ancestry aspect, you can actually go on and order further testing and you can refine the haplogroup. There are numerous <coughs> different subclades within R1B and you'll probably, if you come to some of the later talks today, you'll be hearing about all the different um, subclades of R1B. Um, just a word of warning, when you um, get the um, haplogroup results, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of the newspapers get carried away with stories about haplogroup origins. And there's one British company, unfortunately, which is the, at the root of a lot of this misleading uh, press coverage, um, where they, they've issued stories claiming that you know, one million men descend from Vikings and someone else was uh, descended from Spartacus. Um, treat any of these stories that you read in the press about haplogroups with a very large pinch of salt. Um, we cannot um, draw these conclusions from DNA testing, um, and they're just generally publicity stunts to try and um, drum up sales for this particular testing company. And similarly, if people try and tell you that you can determine your genetic homeland a thousand years ago from a DNA test, it is not that simple. There's a lot more to it. Um, um, so just be very careful um, when you see any of these uh, claims that are being made. Uh, one of the reasons why we can't um, determine um, origins going back a thousand years or more ago is because um, the, the haplogroup, um, uh, the, the distribution of haplogroups is actually very, very different um, when you go back in time. And we are getting much more insight now through ancient DNA testing. And at the moment, haplogroup R1B in Europe is the predominant haplogroup. In the, in the ancient DNA samples, they're now finding that we've got two different haplogroups that predominate, haplogroup G and haplogroup I. Um, but there are very, very few ancient DNA samples available, and there are not even any samples that have been taken from the British Isles at the moment. The, Richard III is probably going to be the first ancient DNA sample published from the British Isles, and there's another study in Cambridge that should be publishing soon where they've got some Anglo-Saxon DNA. Um, but this is a very nice map that you can look at. It's actually an interactive map, and you can actually see all the, um, the samples that have been collected. And at UCL, we have got a website set up where we, um, we, we some of these misleading stories where we're trying to dispel them. So if you want to take a look at that, um, and we've also got a nice page on there which explains how the, the tests work. Um, one very nice project I just wanted to mention quickly is the um, Impact of Diaspora's project, which is run at the University of Leicester, and they're testing, they're doing Y chromosome DNA testing and mitochondrial DNA testing on um, men in Britain, and they are trying to look at these deep... Have I lost my sound here? Uh, let me give you this one instead. I'll change the batteries on that one. Oh, is the battery gone? I think mm. so. Okay. Okay. Right. Thanks. Okay, so the, uh, the impact of Diaspora's project, um, this is a five-year project and there's still some way through, but I think we will get some very interesting insights from this project because they're trying to go back to the Ice Age and look at um, the, the people who actually settled in the British Isles and they are also doing some work with Irish surnames as well. Um, so I now want to move on to mitochondrial DNA, um, which is the, the test that follows the maternal line. Now, mitochondrial DNA is passed on by a mother to both her male and her female children. So it doesn't matter whether you're a male or female, you can, um, anyone can take this test. And this is the test that traces the direct maternal line. So that's your mother, your mother's mother, your mother's mother, and so on back in time. 
And this one is not so useful as a genealogical tool. And one of the problems, of course, is that surnames are passed on in the male line. Um, so, of course, the surname changes every generation. So you haven't got the surname as a clue if you want to find people to test for comparison purposes. But also it's got a, quite a low mutation rate. So if you... What that means is when you, when you have a match with someone, it will confirm that you're related, but the time within which you're related could actually be very, very distant. But this test is useful for deep ancestry purposes, and whenever you read stories in the papers where people have managed to get DNA from ancient samples, it's nearly always mitochondrial DNA. Um, the reason being that within every cell in our body there are thousands of mitochondria, whereas there's only one of all the different chromosomes. So there's a much greater chance that mitochondrial DNA will survive. And this is just a chart just to remind you of the inheritance part. So it is just this one specific line on your family tree. People think of the maternal line as all the ancestors on your mother's, mother's line, but it's not. It's just this one very, very specific line. There are two different types of mitochondrial DNA test. There is, um, when, you, when the tests were first introduced, you could only get a very, very basic test. Um, it's now possible to have your whole mitochondrial genome sequenced. So that, there are actually, this is the genome here, there are actually 16,000 or more base pairs. You can have the whole thing sequenced now, and that would cost you 133 euros. When the tests were first introduced, you could only actually have this little bit tested here. Um, you can have that test done, and that's just 54 euros, but if you're going to have this done, I think it's, it's now worth doing the full sequence. Um, the results, when you get them, they are just a jumble of letters and numbers like this. But again, what the actual letters and numbers mean doesn't matter because these just go into a database and um, it's a, a matchmaking process. And what you're hoping is you will match someone who's got exactly the same markers as you. This is a um, page showing your mitochondrial DNA matches. These are actually my husband's matches. And um, again, you get, the, you get the names and the email addresses of the people that you match. And if you're lucky, they will have provided information about your most distant known ancestor. And then it's a question of contact them, contacting the matches and trying to work out how you're related. In my husband's case, his tree goes back to um, Cambridgeshire. And he had exact matches with two people in America. And their ancestry went back to Germany. Um, so this is obviously a very, very distant re relationship, but it, I mean, it could be that, um, you know, it could be a sort of Anglo-Saxon thing where they came over from Germany and settled in England, but it's a, obviously a very, very distant relationship. And you do find this with mitochondrial DNA. People can have exact matches and the ancestors will sometimes live in different countries. Um, this is just a, um, a, a chart from the Family Tree DNA website which shows you the, the closeness of matches. So um, if you just do the basic test, which is now called the MTDNA plus test, the common ancestor, um, there's a 50% chance the common ancestor could have lived within about the last 700 years. But what that also means is that 50% of those matches will be without, outside 700 years. So um, for family history purposes, that's not particularly helpful, apart from eliminating someone from your inquiries. When you do the full sequence test, 95% um, of matches are supposedly within about the last 550 years. Um, so that's still, when you've got the surname changing every generation, it's still um, quite difficult to, to do the tree there. Um, and that also means that 5% are outside that range, um, and sometimes those very distant matches can actually go back a long way. With mitochondrial DNA, you also get haplogroups, as you do with um, Y-DNA. And they, uh, just to confuse us, the haplogroups um, don't have any correspondence with the um, Y-DNA haplogroups. They all have, again, they have this letter and number system. And it's the same thing where you can actually trace the, the entire tree back through the different haplogroups to what we call mitochondrial Eve, who's the common ancestor of all living people on the planet. Um, and she's thought to have lived something like 2,000 years ago. If you do a mitochondrial DNA test, it's always a good idea to join one of the haplogroup projects. There are haplogroup project, there are projects for all the different uh, mitochondrial DNA haplogroups, and you will get extra help from the, the project administrators who run those projects. 
The mitochondrial DNA haplogroups, like the Y-DNA ones, they all have their own um, distribution patterns. You've got um, particular ones like the, the L haplogroups are all found in Africa. You've got um, the, the Native Americans, um, they are A, B, C, D, and some of them are haplogroup X. Haplogroup M is one that's found in India. That does sometimes turn up in British people, and um, when that happens, it's usually someone who's had an ancestor who was out in British India. And sometimes people can take a DNA test, and they will actually get the clue from the DNA test that they've had an ancestor who was out in British India, and that may even be the only record that they have of that relationship. But within Europe, you've got um, it's the, the main ones are the, in the, the pink section there, the H, U, X, and, and so on. These are the haplogroups you're most likely to find in Ireland. Haplogroup H is the one that predominates. Um, that's around about, it's getting on for 40%. It's about that same frequency throughout Europe. And there are some other haplogroups that you'll see um, that are not quite so common. Haplogroup T tends to be um, fairly common in Ireland. Brian Sykes, who wrote a, a book about um, the Seven Daughters of Eve, he gave all the haplogroups names. Um, and you may sometimes see those names used. Richard III is probably the, the best known example of a, a practical application for mitochondrial DNA testing. Um, and um, I'm sure everyone saw all the, the press releases um, when, uh, his, uh, when, when his uh, body was, was dug up and it was announced that they had a match. It was actually a, a phenomenal feat of genealogical research. Um, a, a, a historian by the name of John Ashdown Hill um, had actually spent many, many years researching Richard III's family tree, actually for another project. Um, Richard III is obviously being a male. He cannot pass on mitochondrial DNA to the next generation, although there weren't any children anyway to, to leave um, descendants. So he had to, to um, look at the, the, his siblings. And um, John Ashton Hill was able to trace the family tree from Anne of York um, right down through the generations to the present day. And a lady called Joy Ibsen um, had her DNA tested even before Richard III was discovered. Um, for another project, and when Richard the Third, when they went ahead with the Richard the Third testing, Joy had actually passed away, and her son Michael Ibsen was tested to provide the sample for comparison purposes. And if you saw the the press conference, um, it was announced at the conference that there was a match. But the, the scientific paper has not yet been published for that. It's, I understand that it's actually in press at the moment and it should be out very, very shortly. So you'll be able to see the methodology. And they have, I understand, also been able to extract Y-DNA. Uh, we know from the testing on Joy Ibsen that she was haplogroup J1C2C. So we assume that that is going to be Richard III's haplogroup. So if you end up taking a DNA test and you, you find out you're a J1C2C, then you might be related to Richard III. Um, I, I should say with the haplogroups, if you do the full sequence test, you will get this detailed haplogroup assignment like J1C2C. If you only do the, the basic test, the, the $59 test, you will just be told your haplogroup J. So having all those extra letters and numbers gives you better geographical resolution. The last test I want to look at is the autosomal DNA test. And this is the test that covers all your ancestors. Um, just one quick biology lesson. Um, autosomal DNA, um, it, it, we talk about autosomal DNA, this covers the 22 pairs of autosomes. Um, uh, males have um, an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, these are the sex chromosomes. Females have um, two Xs. Um, the feature about the Y chromosome is it's passed on unchanged, whereas the autosomes, when they're passed on to the next generation, they get shuffled up. So the DNA that you inherit is actually a patchwork of the DNA from all your different ancestors. And you can see that on the, on the, the picture there. So this test can be taken either by males or by females, and it's called the Family Finder Test. And it puts you, puts you into a matching database and gives you matches with genetic cousins um, and who share a common ancestor within about the last five or six generations. It works best within that time frame. You do get more distant matches, but it's much more difficult trying to make the connection. Um, this test has come down in price considerably. When I bought my test, um, I paid about three times the price that uh, you're paying now, and it's on sale at the show for just 70 euros. And the test works on the principle that the, the, large, when you, the, the larger the portion of DNA that you share in common with your matches, then the closer the relationship. 
And I've just put up a few statistics here um, just to show you how the DNA is diluted with each generation. So you, you get normally, you, you share 50% of your DNA with your siblings, you get 50% of your DNA from your father, 50% from your mother. Um, you get about 25% from each of your grandparents. But the important point here is that these are averages and there are actually considerable variations within those averages. So you may get 27% from one grandparent and 23% from another grandparent. And that effect is magnified as you go uh, down through the generations. And then once you get out to the fifth and sixth cousin level, you only have a very, very tiny percentage of DNA that is shared in common. So with this test, um, if you've got a particular scenario that you want to investigate, it works best within the very, very close generations. If you were to test two second cousins, 99% um, of the time they would show up as a, as a match. I don't think we've ever heard of any second cousins who, have, who do not show up as a match. So if you test two people who should be second cousins and they don't match, then um, there's obviously something funny going on. Um, when you get out to the third cousin level, 90% of third cousins will show up as a match, but that still leaves 10% or 1 in 10 who will not show up as a match. So in this case, um, even if, if you test a third cousin and you don't match each other, it does not rule out that you are, you are still connected. Um, and in that case, you'd have to test other cousins. Once you get out to the fourth cousin level, only about 50% of fourth cousins will show up as matches. And with fifth cousins, it's um, even fewer. But when you take the test, um, because we have so many of these um, fourth and fifth and distant cousins, most of your matches will actually be at that fifth to distant cousin level. Um, well now, although it only covers quite recent generations, I'm sure everyone else is struggling with their family tree as I am. This is my family tree going back for six generations, and I've been doing my research now for um, about 12 years, and I've tried to research all my different family lines, and some lines I can take back a long, long way. Uh, my surname line I can take way back into the 1200s. And my mum's tree, I can, I've got a, a lot of ancestors, all that settled in the same part of Berkshire, and I can actually take those trees way back into the 1600s. But then I've also got big gaps in my tree. Um, so I've actually got a lot of holes in my family tree where I'm hoping that eventually the autosomal DNA will give me matches that will help me to break through those brick walls. And I've also got a great-grandfather born in London who seems to have landed from the moon because there's just no records of his birth whatsoever. Um, and I'm desperately hoping that one day DNA is going to give me the answer to that. Um, now, the complication with um, autosomal DNA is that the inheritance process, is, it's random, and you do not necessarily inherit DNA from all your ancestors. Um, when you go back at this level, so this is, that's my, that's my, parent, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents, you will inherit DNA from all of your great great grandparents. Um, so supposedly only about 0.4% of people will not actually get DNA from all those great grandparents. But once you go to this level, your genetic ancestors actually start dropping off your tree. So you may, this is just a simulation, you may not necessarily have, so it could be that you've got some of these ancestors and you just will not have their DNA it just will not have survived in you. And then that effect is magnified the further back in time you go. So with this test, it's always very important to test the oldest generation. So I've tested myself, but I've also tested my parents. So that takes me back to this generation here. So I, I, by testing them, I can actually fill in those blanks here, and I will be able to fill in some of those blanks further back in my tree. If you haven't got parents available for testing, if you test, say, a sibling... Your sibling will have, she will, they will pick up matches that you don't have. Um, so you can actually fill in some of the gaps that way. So with this test, it really helps to test as many of your relatives as possible. Um, and that also helps to, to work out which line the matches occur on. This is what the match, what, what you get when you get your matches. Um, this is actually my dad's um, family finder match page. And it shows me there at the top of the page as his daughter, fortunately. Um, and this is one of the matches that he got quite recently, which I was very pleased about. 
when you get the, the matches, you get a list of the, if people have provided a list of ancestral surnames, if you've got surnames in common, they will be highlighted in bold like this. <coughs> And this one leaped out of the page at me. My dad's surname is Cruz, and we saw this name here, Cruz, P-E-I, that's Prince Edward Island in Canada. And I'd already done Y-DNA testing on a Cruz in Canada who had matched my, um, my dad's Y chromosome signature. But the Y-DNA, we, we can't get the precise dates from the Y-DNA. We know they share a common ancestor, but it could go, and it could be way, way back in time. Um, I'd managed to highlight... A particular point in the family tree where I thought this um, person had gone from Devon to Prince Edward Island. We'd, in the family tree records, we'd found, we'd found a William George Cruz who disappeared from the English records back in 1841. Um, the records in Canada were not very helpful. I found a marriage certificate in Canada where William Cruz had married a Sarah Burroughs, but unlike the um, certificates, uh, it, the English certificates, there was no parent's name on the certificate. So I've got no paper records that will actually prove that the William Cruz that we've got in Canada is related to the, um, the Cruises from Devon. But um, the, the DNA test results came in. My dad was shown to be a, um, predicted to be, um, it was, a, a, I think it was second to fourth cousin. Um, and when we looked at the paper trail, the, the presumed paper trail, it was, a third, um, it was a third cousin once removed, which was just the relationship you would have expected um, if the, 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 the presumed tree um, was correct. Um, you can see on here how the DNA, um, how you lose DNA with each generation, because th that's my dad's results. These segments here are the DNA, that's the segments of DNA he shares with Mr. Kitson. This is me, and I've only got one of those segments left out of those three segments. So with each generation, you lose segments of DNA. But the nice thing about this is that now I can actually identify I've got this particular segment that came from a particular pair of ancestors. And you can actually go on and, and do that um, in much greater detail the more matches you get. This is a, um, a lovely story. If you just take a DNA test on spec just to see what you might find, um, sometimes we are seeing more and more success stories in the, the Family Tree DNA database. Um, this um, lady, Michelle Rooney, um, when she was a, a baby, she was thrown out, literally thrown out with the rubbish. She was put in a sack um, outside a block of flats in, uh, in London and um, it was about 36 hours later someone went to put their own rubbish out and heard the sound of a baby crying. And um, they rescued the baby and then she was eventually adopted. So for 45 years she did not know anything about her birth parents. She took a test with family tree DNA and um, she had a match with a first cousin. Oh, sorry, <laughs> she had a match with the first cousin. Um, and um, the first cousin was able to look at her family tree and she identified someone she thought might have been Michelle's father. And so this person took a test and the, um, when his test came through, it was a father-son relationship. So she was able to meet her father. Um, the sad thing was that he um, could not remember who the mother was. It was obviously a, obviously been a bit of a, <laughs> a, 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 a bit of a go in his day, and he just had no memory of who her mother was. So she's still trying to find her mother. But we are seeing more and more stories like this in America, in particular. They're getting successes virtually every week now. Not everyone wants to go public. Sometimes they, it's just a, a quiet thing that um, they like to keep to themselves. But if you've got uh, mysteries like this in your family tree, this is the, this is the way to get the answers. Um, the other part of this test um, will give you um, ethnicity percentages. Um, these are all rather vague at the moment. They're, these tests are useful for determining differences at the continental level. So it will tell you whether you're, if, you, if you're looking for African ancestry or Asian ancestry, it's, it, it will pick that out. But it's very difficult at the moment to determine differences between populations in Europe. So these are my results. They're all pretty vague. All my ancestors are from the British Isles, but I've got these percentages here that match with Finland and Eastern Europe. Um, but um, I don't set too much store by any, any of those. Um, but we, the results should improve over time as more reference populations become available. Um, Daniel Crouch will be talking here about the people of the British Isles project, um, which I believe is tomorrow. And they've done some wonderful research where they've collected samples from, it's about 5,000 people 
and all their grandparents were born in the same um, English county. And when they started to plot the results on a map, they, they were able to detect unique clusters within the British Isles. So they found, for example, you can see on here, um, in, they've got a unique cluster here in Cornwall, they've got another cluster in Devon, they've got a, this bit is what's known as Little England in um, Pembrokeshire, that formed a unique cluster, North Wales was, was a unique cluster, and up in Orkney they had differences between the North Island and the South Island. So eventually results like this will be incorporated into the database and we should get much more accurate ethnicity estimations. And once you, the, the good thing is once you've taken the test, um, your results can be updated as more populations become available. So you may get an update every couple of years or so. There is a big project in Ireland called the Irish DNA Atlas Project. This is um, still ongoing at the moment. And they are collecting samples from people in Ireland with um, eight great grandparents all born within the same region which is actually very very strict criteria I think they're having trouble finding people to join the project but if you happen to have eight great grandparents born in Ireland in the same rural region then do get in touch with them I'm sure they'd be delighted to hear from you um, but they are understand they're collaborating with the people of the British Isles project so we should eventually get some very very interesting results from both of those projects um, a quick word about um, GEDmatch. Um, if you upload, this, this is a, a third party website, so when you get your autosomal DNA results, um, you can actually use this website and you can do additional analysis. And this is particularly useful if you're, if you're interested in these ethnicity percentages because there's all sorts of different tools that you can use for that. Um, this is just the sample menu here. They've got a whole load of different admixture percentages and you can compare your DNA with ancient populations and um, all sorts of uh, other things like that. And you can do eye colour predictions. Um, and also, if you ha um, it gives you a way of, of comparing your results with people who've tested with other testing companies. Um, that mostly applies to Americans because Ancestry DNA, their test is only available in America. And there's another company, 23andMe, um, who mainly sell their test in America. So um, that's also a useful way of, of comparing your results with other people. So here's one sample. This is what's called the Eurogenes admixture proportion. I don't tend to get very excited about this type of thing, but some people do, and they, they set great store by all their different percentages. But you can go, there's a whole range of these that you can run through and get all sorts of different percentages, and you can read into them whatever you, whatever you like. Um, the family tree, just a few words about Family Tree DNA, who are the, the main testing company that we use. Um, they are they have the largest Y chromosome DNA database now, over half a million Y chromosome DNA results. They have the largest mitochondrial DNA database in the world, with over getting on for two hundred thousand mitochondrial DNA results. They host all the, the surname projects. Um, when you take a test, it's always very useful to join a project. So make sure you join a surname project. There are haplogroup projects, and there are quite a few geographical projects as well. There's an Ireland DNA project. I run a project for Devon. There are projects for different um, English counties. There are also sub-projects within Ireland. Um, if you wanted to order extra tests, if you're interested in deep ancestry, you can also do that through Family Tree DNA. They even do what's called a big Y test now, where you can sequence as much of your, a huge um, chunk of your Y chromosome, which is the most advanced type of test available. And Family Tree DNA also have a collaboration with the Genographic Project. And this is a deep ancestry project, but they're testing people from all over the world. Um, they've now tested people from over 140 different countries, and those people can transfer their results to Family Tree DNA. So as a result, it's a really nice international database, and you get people from you know, Germany, France, the Middle East, loads of Russians and Poles, and all sorts of people from all over the world will, uh, are joining the database. And um, if you are lucky, um, if your name is on the list of free YDNA tests, um, this is a page on the ISOG wiki, all the surnames on that list you will find on the Family Tree DNA stand downstairs. If your surname is on that list, if you're a male, you will qualify for a free DNA test at this show. So go and have a look at the stand and see if your name is on that uh, list there. If you're looking for resources, um, ISOG is the, the main resource. That's the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. 
Um, and we have a wiki where you'll find all sorts of useful information. We have a very active Facebook group. There's a, a newbie mailing list. And also you'll find um, a lot of the blogs. You'll find a lot of information on the blogs. Um, so do go and have a look at those. And just one last thing, I have got two books that I've written. One is the one on DNA and social networking, and also um, the Surnames Handbook. I have got a few copies with me, but only a handful. Um, but Emily Alicino, who's done another book on genetic genealogy, hers is actually much more up-to-date than mine, So, and she's got lots of copies of her book. So you can get those at the, at the uh, back of the room after this uh, talk. So just to sum up, um, we've looked at the three different types of tests. The Y-DNA test is the one that follows the, the surname line, the father's 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 line. Mitochondrial DNA is the one that follows the mother's line, the mother's 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 line. Autosomal DNA is the one that gives you matches with um, all your genetic cousins on all your family lines, but only within about the last five or six generations. The cost of these tests has plummeted in the last few years, and if you were worried about the cost, it's no longer a reason for not testing. And the more people who test, the more success stories we will, will actually get. It's very important to test people while you still have the chance. You can't suddenly go back in 10 years' time and say, I wish I'd got Uncle Albert or Auntie Joan tested. Um, if, when you are taking tests, it's best used if you've got a particular hypothesis you want to explore. Um, but it can just be fun going on what we call a fishing ship just to see what you might find. And when you take a test, you just never know what you might catch. Okay. Thank you very much, Debbie. The uh, microphone is back on now. Uh, we don't have time for questions, unfortunately, oh, right. because we're right up on the on the mark. So um, right. can I just say thanks very much for sharing your expertise and wisdom with us. Uh, Debbie has got books here, so if anyone's interested in, in buying one of her books, then please contact Debbie. You'll be down at the stand. At I the will, yes. Tree DNA stand. I'll be here for the next two days, so you can always catch me probably somewhere on the Family Tree DNA stand if you want any questions answered. Okay. Great. Thanks, Debbie. because I kept on getting questions.